Good morning, Coo Christian. How are you doing this morning? All right, we got to do better than that. How are y'all doing this morning? We are almost there. How are y'all doing this morning? I can see you in the back over there. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Welcome. Good morning. We are so excited and so grateful to be here in this new season this morning. We're welcoming. We're open. We are glad. We are joyful. And we are free. Most importantly. So as we invite you to worship this morning, you can stand, you can sit, you can worship as you feel comfortable. If you want to come down to the front, we would love if you would come down and dance with us in the front. So here we go. One, two, three. Hey! All right, repeat after me. We're the Spirit of the Lord. is free
time to lift our voices together.
God, we welcome you into this place. We are ready, we are open, and we turn to you. We turn to you and we let go of all of the things that we're carrying, of the burden of any hurt, stress, pressure. We turn to you, Jesus. thanks for what you're about to do. We give you thanks for what you will do over the next few days. We praise you. We glorify you. We lift your name. Hallelujah. We give you thanks. In your precious, almighty, awesome name. Amen. Please be seated. Ben, thank you so much. All right, PowerPoint's up. I'm so happy my fonts turned out well. Um, I was worried about that. Yeah, now your first impression of me is that I'm really petty about fonts. Yeah, it's funny because it's true. Um, can we pray together? Let's pray. Lord, join our hearts together today. Guide us towards love and grace for one another. May we engage with each other encourage each other, challenge each other, and forgive each other. Amen. The year 2000. I'm sitting in my elementary school classroom in the suburbs of Chicago. The teacher is reading from a Dr. Seuss book, and when she gets to a part that talks about an Asian man eating food with two sticks, the entire classroom bursts into laughter. And I'm sitting there wondering why that's so funny, and I feel like an outsider because I'm not American enough. The year 2003, I start attending church youth group, and I, saw, I see all these boys playing basketball and volleyball and talking about girls, and I feel like an outsider because I'm not masculine enough. The year 2008, I'm realizing that I love expressing myself on stage and on camera, and I start to think about pursuing an acting career. And then I realize that I'm the only Asian auditioning for the school plays and musicals. And I realize just how few opportunities there are for people like me in Hollywood. And I feel like an outsider because I'm not represented nor visible enough. The year 2009, I'm the subject of gossip in my church amongst the Asian parents, thankfully not my own, who tend to care more about whether their children are on track to get into the top schools around the country rather than whether they'll still follow Jesus in college. And they talk about us in a language that I can hardly understand because I grew up in America trying so hard to fit in. And I feel like an outsider because I'm not Asian enough. The year 2010, I found out that a girl at school likes me, which is surprising because, come on, have you seen this face? Um, and I start dating her and I eventually wind up breaking her heart. Because no matter how hard I try, I can't love her like I'm supposed to. And I feel like an outsider because I'm not straight enough. The year 2017, only two years ago, I'm fired from my pastoral position at my old church for being gay. And I feel like an outsider because I'm not Christian enough. My name is Ray. I'm a gay Asian American Christian pastor. And I say all these things about being an outsider because I know that every single one of us here knows what that feels like just by being here. In fact, I'll be the first to say here that many of you probably have even more examples and reasons than I do, whether because of your gender or your race or economic status. Every single person here knows what it feels like to be an outsider. And yet you've gathered here and you've created this space for yourselves. And I just want to say that I am proud of every single one of you here because you've demonstrated that you are strong, that you are resilient, 
that you are courageous. And for that, I say that every single one of you is welcome here at Q Christian Fellowship's Love Undivided Conference. Now, I'll admit that I was a little bit surprised when I was invited to speak for you today. Um, because if you look at all the other amazing speakers that we have lined up for this weekend, you'll see that I'm by far the youngest and by far the least experienced. Compared to the others, I'm not nearly as accomplished nor prominent in the area of LGBT issues. We've got incredible people lined up, including counselors, bishops, mayors, musicians. The most I've done is speak at a few conferences, um, have an article published by the Huffington Post. And, and, when I was in high school, I wrote a song called Look Up Child that I'm pretty sure was stolen by Christian artist Lauren Daigle for her own song, which has the same name. I told you I'm really petty. I told you I'm really petty. Uh, but I digress. The point, the point is that I have a lot of respect for all the other speakers here, and I'm excited to hear from each one because I know that they'll all have something good to bring to the table. But there is one thing that I can be proud of, one thing that I can draw my credibility from, one thing that sets me apart. Ready for this? It's the fact that I'm a dirty, self-absorbed millennial who spends all my time on my phone. And I'm only half joking, I think. Um, but I realized that I do spend a lot of time on my phone and on the internet. And that's exactly why I want to start off by talking about what it means to be love undivided in the age of technology. And given that I grew up experience the rise, uh, experiencing the rise of what we now know as the internet, I've been able to look back and reflect on how it has both united us and divided us. You see, with the internet, we can be more connected to each other than ever. It is, in a way, the most wonderful thing to happen to someone who feels like an outsider. When the internet first started becoming accessible, suddenly you could find people who were just like you, people who understood what it was like to be an ethnic or a sexual minority. I know I can't be the only one who spent years typing the word gay and the word Christian into Ask Jeeves or Alta Vista. <laughs> Major throwback, right? And then finally one day I decided to search gay and Christian together, and what I found was just an entire world of people, young and old, who were also going through the same thing that I was. That's the beauty of technology. Um, but the internet has also presented a lot of interesting phenomena that I wanted to reflect on, especially as it me comes to mean uh, love undivided. And keep in mind that I don't necessarily talk about these things in a critical way. Um, in fact, the, really my first and most natural response to the internet is wonder. Wonder because I'm in awe of its possibility, but wonder also because I'm curious about its implications. I, I genuinely wonder what God intended when he allowed mankind to come up with the internet. You know, did he, did he intend for it to become everything that it, that it did? Um, for example, did God intend for the church to be so accessible online? You know, as a pastor, I can say that it's wonderful to be able to upload sermons um, for people to listen to, but I also recognize the danger in letting that be the only part of the church that a person ever experiences, you know, especially a college student who just can't seem to wake up on Sundays. We've all been there. That's just an example, but it reflects a lot of the other things that we're seeing with the internet. In the same way, the ease and opportunity of meeting people just like us has been instrumental in helping others to find a home in this world. Suddenly, you're not the only one out there who loves God and yet feels attracted to the same gender. Suddenly, you're not the only person who has grown up in church and yet doesn't feel like what a boy or girl is supposed to be like. Suddenly, you're not the only one who feels terrified and alone. But as time has gone on and the internet has become an even bigger part of our lives, we've seen something else happen. We've seen that same convenience of meeting like-minded individuals cause us to form a sense of tribalism where we only listen to the voices and opinions of those who agree with us. There's no problem with wanting to spend time with people who have shared experiences and journeys, but technology has also made it very easy for us to either retreat from conversations with different perspectives or attack people who hold those perspectives in the most antagonistic way possible. And the internet has been, made it very easy for us to either disconnect from any voice that disagrees with us, um, that we perceive as toxic, or otherwise be as toxic as we can sometimes. In fact, sometimes both happen at the same time. We fire our opinions over and over again at someone until it's convenient for us to just duck out and disengage. Um, as the architect Michael on NBC's hit comedy, The Good Place says, he says, there's nothing as rare as a double rainbow or someone on the internet saying, you know what, you've convinced me, I was wrong. <laughs> 
and I happen to love that quote, not just because he talks about a double rainbow, and come on, we're at an LGBT conference, <laughs> um, but also because the part about the internet is just very, very true. Y'all should check out the show if you haven't, by the way. It's pretty funny, and uh, Asian guy is uh, really cute. Um, <laughs> and if it was just contained to the internet, this mysterious, ever-changing world of cyberspace that we can log on and off at any moment, that might be okay. But given how much time all of us, myself included, spend on the internet each day, it's easy to see how that behavior can seep into the rest of our lives. Whereas it's easy to just unfriend or unfollow someone who shares a different political view than us, we can't always do that in the workplace or our schools or our churches. Whereas it's easy to sit from an anonymous username and attack a person for their ideology, we can't always do that in a society that forces us to work alongside, serve alongside, and even seek the good of those who might disagree with us, like it says in Jeremiah 29. Why is this important? Because when used well, the internet can bring together people. It can bring together outsiders who live on opposite ends of the world and make them feel like they belong somewhere. But when misused, the internet can also cause us to exhibit some of the same tendencies of aggression and exclusion that we were once victims of. Every single one of us here remembers how it felt sitting there in that pastor's office or that Bible study or that family dinner and trying to explain to them what it meant to be gay or transgender and seeing them just shut their ears to us and shut their minds off to us, not even give us a chance to explain, not even give us a chance to share our story not even give us a chance to be who we are. And I know that every single one of us here remembers how that felt. And I wonder if maybe the internet has made it easy for us to treat people the same way and continue that same behavior. It's easy to see how we who once were victims of it can fall into the same cycle. And it's not really about figuring out who's to blame for this. It's just what it means to be human in an increasingly industrialized and yet divided world. The irony of the internet is that information is more accessible than ever, but we are, we've also become better at filtering what information that we take in. We've become more connected than ever, but we've also become more divided. We've created spaces that we determine who can and cannot be a part of, and we've been made to feel like an outsider, but we've often wielded that power to make others feel the same way. Even within our LGBT spaces, there are people who feel unwelcome or represented, unrepresented, and anyone who's an ethnic minority can tell you that much. And I was thinking about the reason for these tendencies, and I believe that it's all because of a small, quirky part of my childhood. Does anyone remember what this is? Or is it too ancient for some of us? It's a label maker. This archaic handheld device basically presses letters onto pieces of tape, which you can then peel off and then stick onto things, right? Um, well, my, so when I remember when I was younger, my father got one of these, and he let me use it. Well, what happens when you give a 10-year-old kid something that can print off sticker labels, right? He goes around and he labels everything. This, I, I, when I was younger, I just remember even the boring, mundane things, I would label everything by its name. A notebook, a chair, a table. Seriously, I was putting things on, labels on things left and right, you know, as if they would stop being what they were if I didn't. You know, better label this pencil sharpener, otherwise it might not give, sharpen my pencil someday. I don't know. See, it, it, it's, it's fun. It's fun to label things, right? It gives us a sense of assurance of what it is. Maybe it helps us to remember how to describe what it is. But by and large, labels have also taken a lifeblood of their own, especially on the internet. Just like something that has life, labels have grown and evolved with the times. Now more than ever, to be labeled as a certain people group affects the way that society sees you. Being labeled a, uh, a, a liberal means something entirely different now than it did 20 years ago. Being labeled a Republican means something entirely different now than it did 20 years ago. Being labeled a Christian means something entirely different now than it did 20 years ago. Being labeled Asian or black, well, honestly, that hasn't really changed too much, but uh, we're, we're working on it. Um, and the point I'm trying to make is that labels have become a way to judge a person and attack them. They've also become a, a way to just immediately affiliate or disengage with somebody. When used correctly, labels can help us to identify ourselves and seek out similar people with similar experiences. But when abused or even taken to an extreme, labels can cause us to place our own assumptions on other people. If a person is progressive, they must support these causes. If a person re voted Republican, they must hate these people groups. 
And as you can see, these, are, these assumptions, they happen on all sides of the issue, whether it's liberal or conservative, white or black, gay or straight, pro-life or pro-choice. And we do it because it's convenient. We do it because labels allow us to categorize people and group them together. They allow us to sift out what is pleasing to us and what is not. They, like the internet, allow us to disengage from others if we want to. And I'm not exempt from this either. I have to constantly and personally apologize to anyone who has been hurt by the way that I've categorized them or made assumptions about them. See, I'm passionate about social justice. I believe that in the inherent dignity and worth and value of every individual. But even I have to admit that if I reduce a person to a label just because I perceive their ideology to be hateful or intolerant, I'm not actually working towards justice. In fact, by reducing someone to a label, I'm actually dehumanizing them and their story. Prejudice, it's a human issue. Yes, there is a form of prejudice that has permeated our systems and taken the form of discrimination and oppression. But prejudice is also an individual choice, one that we all have the ability to make. Not all of us are in a position to be oppressors, but any one of us is capable of becoming aggressors. And when that happens, it prevents us from being who we truly want to be, progressors. But the point is that people are inherently more than their labels. People are inherently more than their beliefs and ideologies. And people are individually even more than their groups. Every single person has a story. And to treat people as human is to allow them to be fully known in that story. You can't define a person by a single ideology any more than you can define an ideology by a single person. One label can't be represented by a single person, just like how one person can't be represented by a single label. And as an Asian American, I actually resonate with this very personally, because as the child of immigrants, I'm constantly torn between two worlds, never really fitting into either one. 2018 was actually a great year for showcasing that. That's right, y'all know I'm gonna talk about Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> It is about an Asian American girl named Rachel who travels to Asia with her boyfriend and upon meeting his incredibly wealthy family is faced with her boyfriend's disapproving mother. A mother who sees Rachel as nothing more than a spoiled, entitled American who only cares about her own happiness over family and filial piety. In the mother's eyes and in Eastern culture, self-sacrifice and hard work is much more important than personal desire. And though it's far from a perfect movie, it highlighted this tension between what it means to be Asian and what it means to be American. It highlighted this tension between what it means to be Eastern and what it means to be Western. And the reason why it resonated with so many Asian Americans is because we constantly experience people placing assumptions on us because we're Asian and others placing assumptions on us because we're American. In the same way, all of us here know the tension between being LGBT, and being Christian. We all know what it's feel like, it feels like to not entirely fit in to what the rest of the world might think of either group. And we all know that we are so much more than our labels, that it's because of the labels that the churches we grew up in have made us feel like outsiders, that we've all had assumptions placed on us, and that we've all been victims of exclusion and marginalization. So I ask you, Let's not exhibit the same behavior towards others. Let's not define other people by their labels, and in doing so, either attack them or disconnect from them. Because even if we are able to form communities around these labels, sooner or later, we're going to find something that we disagree on. I guarantee it. I guarantee that it's going to happen even in this space at this conference, that even if the people we meet here might agree with us on gender and sexuality issues, eventually something is going to come up whether it's abortion or immigration or foreign policy, that we disagree on. And we can either allow that to break a relationship or we can recognize the dignity of each person's choice and have a conversation, have a dialogue with each other. Let's not be hostile and let's not disconnect. In a world that is increasingly divided over issues of identity, we also can't decide for someone which label takes precedent over another. For example, I've been in spaces that were mostly white, and I can assure you that the color of my skin made me feel way more out of place than my sexuality did, and that goes for both queer and not queer spaces. Um, basically, my Asianness was felt more at the time. Similarly, I've been in Asian spaces where I felt out of place because it was mostly cisgender heterosexual people, and my queerness was felt more at the time. And finally, my closest friend right now is an Asian-American cisgender heterosexual pastor. 
Because in a time when my heart beats for the world to experience the love of Jesus Christ, my occupation and my vocational calling is felt more when I'm with him. This phenomenon is part of a theory called intersectionality, that because of my race, I can feel more like a minority in LGBT spaces. But the opposite is also true, that because of my sexuality, I can also feel like a minority even in Asian spaces and so on. And that's the mysterious and complex and difficult thing about intersectionality. But that's also the beautiful thing about it. Because even though intersectionality specifically deals with discrimination and marginalization, there's a lot we can learn from it. Because we all are made up of different labels and categories and people groups, no matter who we are. We all are an intricate web of experiences that causes us to be who we are. And it's precisely because people are more than their labels that we can begin to treat each other as human beings. Every person has the right to be fully known in their labels. We must not decide what a label means for someone, nor place assumptions on them. At its most innocent, it's prejudice. At its worst, it leads to exclusion, and that can happen even in inclusive spaces. And I'll admit that living with so many labels has caused me a lot of pain as a queer Asian American Christian. But it's also given me a sense of empowerment. This ability to embrace all of my backgrounds, embrace all of my labels as I feel called to, and not completely cut myself off. Every time I want to disconnect from my old conservative church I grew up in for just how I treated LGBT issues, I remember. I remember just how formative it was in discipling me and teaching me how to follow Jesus. Every time I want to disconnect from my Asian culture for expecting me to sacrifice my own happiness for the sake of my family, I remember my parents who came here to this country as outsiders and as immigrants and sacrificed their own happiness for the sake of me. Dare I say that there are some parts of my Asian culture that we can all learn from. Dare I say that there are some parts of conservative church culture that we can actually learn from. And I continue to experience this tension between different labels in many other ways as well, being a gay Christian who is also celibate. Now, what does it mean to be celibate? It means that I feel the calling from God to stay single. And already with that, I've faced a whole lot of assumptions from all sides about who I am. And I hope to be able to talk a little bit about that. Now, just a disclaimer that I'm also deeply involved with a community of people who identify as side B, the belief in the traditional understanding of marriage. And while I myself actually don't like to use labels when it comes to this issue or this theology, I recognize that I have the opportunity to represent a community here who want their voices to be heard. Because I know that a lot of people have felt judged or silenced even in this space. And don't get me wrong, I recognize that to be associated with celibacy or side B theology is to be associated with a conservative belief system that has historically contributed to the oppression of LGBT people. I recognize that. And I recognize that oppression still persists today. I'm going to talk more about that later. But like I said before, even if the majority of people here might not be in the position to be oppressive, any one of us is capable of being aggressive towards each other. This space is not exempt from being guilty of prejudice. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it in some way. And so here's my chance to clear up some misconceptions. First of all, I want to clarify right now that I, and many like myself, am firmly against gay conversion therapy or side X. In 2018, yeah, I'm going to take a drink. Off. In 2018 was actually a great year for highlighting that issue. Our very own Darren Calhoun had his story featured in several publications, including People magazine. Do you guys know that? Well, very fancy. My Asian mom would be proud of you. Um, and we also had not one but two movies that depicted the harmful practices of conversion therapy, and both were very powerful. By the way, and I hope that this is the most controversial thing that I say today, Boy Erased, which was directed by a straight, white, cisgender man, was a great movie. It was amazing, very powerful. But the miseducation of Cameron Post, which was directed by a queer woman of color, was like a thousand times better of a movie. (laughs) And as a film junkie, I will fight you on that. As an Oscar junkie, I'll fight you on that. Um, Another clarification is that celibacy for me is a calling. It's not something that I've settled for because I couldn't find anyone, although look at this face. Um, But it's also not something that I'm choosing because I'm too scared or repressed to pursue a relationship. It's something that I truly believe is the journey that God has called for my life. It's like the calling to full-time ministry. I simply cannot picture myself doing anything else. 
In the same way with all the different ministries and just uh, causes that I'm involved with, my schedule is so filled with people that I simply can't picture myself giving myself to one person. And from this, I can also tell you that being celibate and or side B also doesn't mean that we're pure or that we think more highly of ourselves. In fact, I'll be the first person to say that my romantic and sexual history is incredibly broken. I've hurt other people and I've hurt myself. But the reason why I know that celibacy is my calling is because I keep coming back to it. I hear the voice of God drawing me back to it. Another thing that I can also say is that one of the heaviest criticisms lodged against um, me and my community is that I'm fundamentally opposed to your same-sex partner or spouse, that I don't believe your relationship is blessed by God. And here's where I actually have a lot of compassion um, because I recognize that many people in the church have made LGBT couples feel illegitimate, and I recognize that, and I apologize on behalf of the church. But here's where I hope to be more than whatever conservative or side B label has been placed on me because here's where I personally feel my pastoral label and my pastoral heart beating more than ever for you because I want to see you past the labels and past the ideologies. I want to see you as a person. I want to see your partner as a person. I want to meet your partner. I want to share a meal with you, and I want you to teach me. And I feel like I can have that kind of open mind as a pastor. Why? Because as a pastor who generally occupies conservative spaces, I see a lot more cisgender heterosexual couples that probably are not blessed by God. I see, I see, a, lot, I see a lot of straight couples who should not be together. And in the place, places I've ministered, I've seen far more straight people dating way too early or dating someone who's not compatible with them, somebody who's not healthy for them. And that's not a theological issue, right? That's a spiritual issue, and that's a pastoral care issue, and that's what grieves me as a pastor. So if, if you're scared of me and what I think of you at this conference, I hope I can demonstrate to you that you don't have to be, um, because I guarantee that I'm far more concerned about the Jonathan and Rachels in my life who are hurting each other by being together. And I, and I know that I have a lot more to prove being up here. Give me the chance to prove to you that I love you that I love your partner, that I see you and your partner or spouse as the human beings that you are. There are many other things I could say to either represent myself or the community here that identifies as celibate and or side B, but perhaps the biggest thing to clear up is that for the most part, we're not militantly trying to force any kind of theology on anyone. We just don't have that kind of power. For the most part, many of us are just trying to stay alive in our churches where we face condemnation almost daily from our pastors and our leaders. We're just trying to keep our, our jobs in our conservative spaces that constantly demonize LGBT people. We're trying to show our churches that we are more than labels, that we are more than politics, and we're trying to create more space for others like us in our churches. And that leads me to my next point. Once we can get past the labels, once we can see beyond the categories and the people groups, what's the next step? How can we work towards our vision of being love undivided? It's by creating space for more voices, by creating space for those who feel like outsiders, and by creating space for inclusion. And that's exactly what I and many like myself are trying to do in our churches. We can, we can all agree that conservative churches right now do not have space for LGBT people. We can all agree that gay conversion therapy camps still exist, that LGBT youth are still getting kicked out of their homes, and that people like me are getting fired or shamed by our churches. And across the country, there are vulnerable LGBT youth who are suffering in their churches. And not everyone, not everyone has the privilege of just going to another church, by the way. Not every kid living out in rural America under their parents has the freedom to just find another community or family. Benjamin Wood was a boy who loved church. He loved youth group, and he loved justice. He was also gay. And one day, when he attended a meeting for his church's mission trip, he was put on the spot for being gay. He was singled out for it. And right in front of him, the leader asked everyone at the meeting whether they felt comfortable being around Benjamin and whether they understood that Benjamin was going to hell. Benjamin left that meeting in tears, and he took his own life at 21 years old. I survived the way that my church treats LGBT issues, but not every kid does. And that's why I occupy conservative spaces. That's why I fight for space for LGBT youth in my church. Times are changing, but realistically, conservative churches are going to be around for a while. And they're the ones with the political and financial influence, as we know. Even more than that, 
they are the ones with spiritual and emotional influence on young LGBT youth. So rather than distance ourselves from the powers that be in this country, I and many celibate LGBT Christians are asking ourselves, how can we create more space in our churches for LGBT people? Because there is an entire world of LGBT youth living in those very spaces, and our churches still act like we don't exist. Of course, I'm going to be hurt for it, hurt by it. And as, as you know, I already have been. Being fired from my church in the summer of 2017 for being gay is something that still lives with me to this day. Being seen as a pedophile, a, a prostitute, a rapist is something that still lives with me to this day. And it took many conversations, many of which were with people from affirming churches, to help me understand that trauma is real. Trauma is, is, is real and it's powerful and it's something that I'll have to deal with for the rest of my life. And yes, many people have told me to just up and move to another church. But I continue occupying these conservative spaces because I believe that they can change. That they can change in the way they treat LGBT people. That they can change so that young LGBT children who are growing up in these spaces will not meet the same end of their lives as Benjamin and so many others do. I look to the example of Jesus, who also did not connect from the Pharisees, even as he reached out to the poor and the marginalized. Jesus believed in the Pharisees and wanted to transform them as well. You know how I know that? Because no matter how far Jesus traveled, no matter how many poor and sick he healed, the Pharisees were always there with a snarky comment. You ever notice that when you read stories from the gospel? Why are the Pharisees always there? I believe, I believe that Jesus wanted to see from the Pharisees what I want to see from the church, a radical transformation of the oppressive systems of this world. And sometimes that involves entering into those spaces rather than disconnecting from them. Sometimes that involves creating space for inclusion and representation. Representation matters. And in a world where LGBT people and Christians are constantly fighting for more space, people like me are trying to fight for the people who are caught in the middle of it. We're trying to create space for the people who are made to feel like outsiders in the middle of it. And I feel like I can speak to this being Asian American as well. Because as, as Asian Americans, we are try, constantly trying to fight for more space and for more representation. We're constantly caught between two sides of the race debate, and often we're silenced in the process. Representation matters, and yet Asians usually lose out on that. We have the case where basketball player Jeremy Lin was constantly blasted with racial slurs, which, had a similar thing happened to any other ethnic minority sports player, would have been unacceptable. Or if you're like me and you have no idea what is a sport, um, we had cases <laughs> like the, we had cases like the 2016 Academy Awards. It was the year of hashtag Oscars so white, and Chris Rock himself called out Hollywood for not featuring black actors, and yet in the same show had several racist comments and jokes against Asians. Representation matters. It matters for ethnic minorities, and it matters for sexual minorities in our conservative churches. And in the spirit of and in the spirit of bridging divides and supporting each other, I might as well take this time to speak up for my fellow uh, queer Asians and their romantic lives. Um, keep in mind, being a celibate person, I have nothing to gain from this. Um, <laughs> so you know that I'm trying to help out my fellow Asians. But here goes. Y'all need to stop swiping left on Asian men and stop fetishizing Asian women. <laughs> it's a disturbing trend. It's, it's a disturbing trend that Asian men get the least amount of attention on dating apps and are frequently met with the message, sorry, not into Asians. It's a disturbing trend that Asian women are often portrayed as objects that are docile and submissive. Society has already demasculized Asian men as weak and unattractive while also painting Asian women as exotic creatures who only exist for our consumption. So I ask you, if you're looking to date, don't continue that same behavior in our queer spaces. Don't do that to our fellow queer Asian men and women. Again, speaking entirely for myself and not, uh, speaking entirely for others and not for myself, I promise you, we Asians, we're interesting people. We have personalities too. We, we also enjoy vanilla lattes and the occasional avocado toast. So, I know white people culture. Um, so the point, the point is that I and many others like myself, we're just trying to, trying to create more space. We're trying to create more space for LGBT people, like in conservative spaces that I occupy. Yeah. And I know that for the majority of people here, that seems like a lost cause. All I can really say is that it's our calling. Just like many callings, we feel it, and we know it, and we'll give our lives to it. And so I'm not asking us to understand it, 
but I do believe we can support each other. And you absolutely can, starting here at this conference, you absolutely can by forming relationships with people that go beyond the labels, that see each other as human, and that empower one another in our respective callings. But there is another way that you can support us, another way in which we are fighting for space. And this is something that everyone can actually participate in regardless of what kind of church you go to. Being celibate, we're also fighting for more space for single people. By and large, culture values married people above single people. We see it in our music and entertainment industries. We see it in our advertising, in our holidays. And that mindset also infiltrates our churches as well. It's present in our gossip. We're always asking each other whether we found a boyfriend or a girlfriend yet. It's present in our church programs, taking the form of things like a disproportionate amount of couples retreats and marriage seminars. And it's present in our church leadership as well. Singlehood is seen as a disease or a disorder, something that makes us unhappy until we finally find someone. This is something that can happen whether you're in a conservative or an affirming church, by the way, gay or straight. The reality is that God only knows not everyone is going to get married. It's just not something any of us can promise to each other, no matter how much we value it. And so if we don't make space in our churches for singlehood, we are going to have a generation of people who die off having a, lived a very unfulfilled life. And, and that would be a very sad thing for me to see as a pastor. I was just talking with my friend the other day and I asked her whether she was happy being single. She said that she was, but then she thought about it and she said, actually I would be if I wasn't always reminded of it. I was, I was talking with another friend who told me a story about a single woman in her church, I think she was in her late 30s, and she was constantly being asked by others when she was gonna settle down and get married. She was also constantly being asked to babysit for the married couples. Do you see what was going on there? That basically this woman is seen as either on her way to marriage or she only exists to support the married people in the church. And that's a terrifying thought to me. Singlehood is a calling, but we often treat it like a curse. And to be fair, sometimes it really is difficult. Sometimes it really is lonely, especially given the culture that we live in. But for the most part, to be called to singleness is a blessing as well. Being single means that you have time to do things like volunteer at a soup kitchen on Christmas morning or spend New Year's Day binge watching the entire final season of a series of unfortunate yes. events on Netflix, yes. both of which I did this past month, by the way. A <laughs> little bit of a uh, banner snatch and bird, bird box thrown in there as well. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. Um, but the point is that singleness should be an empowering thing, right? And yet our churches and our culture don't even treat it that way. I think there's something to be said about how two of the most prominent figures in the New Testament, Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul, were both single. I think there's something to be said about how influential both of them were in their singleness. You ever notice that the Bible over time actually shifts its focus from married people like Abraham and Moses to single people such as Jesus and Paul? And yet we pity those who don't have a partner or spouse and we see them as incomplete. And when we're constantly urging each other to find someone, we actually cause each other to be less happy than we could be about the potential that we have in the here and now. It's easy to be single when you're young and you feel like you have the rest of your lives to find someone. But think of the widow who is often overlooked in the church. Think of the divorced woman who is already scorned because of her broken marriage. Think of the older gentleman who sees a generation of young people falling in love and he's tormented by depression because of the little time that he has left. Maybe that's some of you sitting here. Are these people in our churches whom we will love? Are these people whom we will serve and empower. This next thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, especially poignant to me uh, because it's very personal to me. Um, one of the er other areas in which we can create space for more leadership, uh, for, for single people, I'm sorry, is in our leadership, for single people in our church leadership and specifically amongst our pastors. And I know that no church has any official rule that you have to be married to be a pastor. It's not you're gonna get fired for it. Huh. Um, but it says, it's definitely implicit. It's definitely implicit. If you take a look at the churches across America, by and large, most of them are, most of the lead pastors are married with children. And it's just kind of this unspoken aspect of church culture that fa favors married pastors over single pastors. And I know that a lot of times, you know, past, the reasons pastors have to do things like counsel people who are in a relationship or who are getting married or going through experiences like having kids. And to an extent, that's understandable. The basic argument is that single pastors wouldn't be very good at counseling married, past, uh, married people. But let me tell you a secret that I've come to learn over the years. I don't think married pastors are all that good at counseling single people. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I feel like 
If you're single, you only ever hear one of two things from a married pastor. It's either something like, you're probably single right now because God is growing you and preparing you for the person he will bring you. (laughs) Or something like, God is teaching you how to be content in your singleness. Maybe not in that voice, you know, we're talking about straight pastors here. But (laughs) both of those are problematic. Both of those are problematic, right? The first one because it still implies that everyone is on their way to marriage. And that's just not true whether you're gay or straight. And as a pastor, I wouldn't want to promise someone something that I can't be sure they're called to. The second one is problematic because when we use the word content, we might think that we're referring to the Apostle Paul when he says in Philippians 4 to be content in need and in plenty. But more often than not, content is used to connotate, you know, just a more unwilling acceptance. In other words, just settling for something less. It doesn't refer to the actual abundance and potential of a single life. And therefore, the word content when used by married pastors, can often come across as just patronizing or condescending. And I know this part is about single people, but I know that many of us as LGBT people have heard this from our pastors as well. It's patronizing and condescending to be told by a pastor that we don't have enough faith or that we're not content enough, and then watch him as he puts his arm around his loving wife. Say what you will about single pastors counseling married people, but in a time when the younger generation is staying single longer and getting married later in life anyways, married pastors aren't great at counseling single people, and you can guarantee that there are a lot more of them in our churches these days. That's why representation matters. That's why we need more single representation, not just in our congregations, but in our church leadership. We need pastors who will be able to talk to a single person and not pity them or be overly sensitive to them, but who will instead look them in the eyes and say that you matter. You have so much to give to the church. You are needed by the church. God needs you in his church. No matter what kind of church we're in, conservative or affirming, we all have the ability to change the way that culture views single people. So I've talked about how we can become love undivided by first going beyond the labels and seeing each other as human, second by creating space for representation, and specifically I'm trying to do that for LGBT people and single people, And finally, I believe that we can become loved and divided by coming together around the issues that we agree on. Ultimately, as LGBT Christians, there are more things that we can agree on than disagree on. Ultimately, there are more things that we can be for rather than against. And I believe that there is no greater cause to be for together than justice. Justice for vulnerable LGBT youth in the world. Justice for the child growing up in church under oppressive gender stereotypes. Justice for the kid who comes out to their parents and is kicked out of their home. I work with inner city youth in New York City, and the homelessness rate among LGBT youth is 40% higher than the average. No matter what our theological beliefs are, we can agree that that's a problem and that we can work towards justice together. The Hebrew word for justice is mishpat, and when we think of justice, we often think of laws and judgment, condemnation. But one of the definitions of justice in the Hebrew lexicons is shared community. Shared community. And I think that's a perfect way of just summarizing everything I've been talking about. Shared community is about seeing past the labels. Shared community is about creating space for all people. And if we can agree that LGBT people are suffering in churches across America, I think we can agree that we are called to bring justice to those spaces. So rather than distance or disconnect ourselves from those spaces, some of us are called to enter in. Some of us are called to change these systems from the inside out. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, some are called to be prophets, some are called to be teachers, but some are called simply to be shepherds. We live in a culture that values outrage and criticism, especially when done at a distance. And some people are good at that, as we probably know. But not everyone is called to be an activist or a prophetic voice. Not everyone is even given the gift of words. Some activists are called to the quieter work, the work that causes us to be criticized from every side. Dare I say that my old youth pastor was right when he said that sometimes God will lead us to die to ourselves in order to serve others. Dare I say that my immigrant parents taught me that sometimes the biggest change comes through self-sacrifice, through the laying down of your life for the sake of your family. When I was in college, I was part of a bunch of campus Christian fellowships, and many of them have run into controversy over the treatment of LGBT staff and members. Um, And many queer staff staff workers have left these organizations in the past. But I do have many friends who have stayed. I have many friends who continue to occupy these spaces as staff workers. And even though they continue to hurt daily, they do it so that they can serve young queer students who also hurt during one of the most vulnerable parts of their transition into adulthood. 
I have a friend named Cal who is here, and y'all should totally meet her. And she said this, I'm working basically 24-7 trying to make this place as not traumatizing as possible for our queer students. Now, to be fair, yeah, I, just, I, I will applaud to that. I will applaud to her and her work. Now, to be fair, for some people, it's healthy to leave those conservative spaces, especially if they continue to be toxic and traumatic to you. And I encourage you to leave if you're called. I genuinely support you in that. Just, just don't be hostile towards those of us who are called to stay because there are outsiders all over America and there are Benjamin Woods all over America and I will not abandon them. I will not leave them behind to suffer. I just can't. I don't know what your calling is. I really don't. But I hope that I've been able to encourage you all to support each other in your callings, especially when the commonality is that we all want to see justice for LGBT people, a shared space for every single one of us here. And two years ago was my first time at this conference, and I remember meeting so many people who were different from me. Didn't matter what I or they believed. Most of my closest friends from two years ago, you know, are, 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 just, are here today, you know, and, we're, and we still built out that relationship. So I encourage you, let's start doing that this weekend. Reach out and meet someone. Go beyond the labels and listen to their story. Create space for each other that are filled with love and not division. And find out how to work together in a world that is suffering. I used to think that we lived in a world of irreconcilable differences. And I used to think that some divisions were just too big to undo. But then I remember just how deep the chasm was between our Lord and Savior. I remembered just how great the distance was between us and the one to whom we belong. That which separates us from each other is nothing compared to that which separates us from God. That which sets you and me apart is nothing to that which set us apart from God. And if Jesus could cross that divide, we can too. Because we are courageous, we are resilient, and we are strong. I love you all, and I want to meet you this weekend. And I want to work together with you to bring justice to this world. Thank you for letting me share with you today. Let's, let's, let's pray. God, you are love undivided. You looked at us and saw how far we were from you, how different from you we had become. And you crossed that divide. Help us do the same for each other this weekend so that every outsider is brought into this space and experiences the life and love that only comes from you. Amen. Thank you.